Um, I'd like to now welcome Ella S. Mills, who's kindly presenting on behalf of Dr. Sophie Orlando, who, as I said, uh, couldn't be with us today. Ella is uh, currently completing her doctorate at Leeds University, uh, and her research involves the 1980s surge of creative practice and activity now referred to by many as the, black, um, as the British Black Arts Movement. Her focus is specifically on the negotiations and interventions of women artists of colour, and her thesis is centred on the early careers of artists such as Shatapa Biswas, Sonia Boyce, Lubaina Hamid, Claudette Johnson, Ingrid Pollard and Maud Salter, and their participation in, or in relationship to, the 1985 ITA exhibition, The Thin Black Line, alongside the 2011 exhibition, Thin Black Lines, at Tate Britain. And just a note on, uh, on Sophie, in case you don't know of her work. Uh, Sophie Orlando is an art historian, art critic, and associate professor at the Villa Arson in Nice, France. And she's also a researcher on the Black Artists and Modernism Project. Her PhD from the Paris Sorbonne University looked at black art and Britishness from 1979 to 2010, and she's the editor of the book Art and Mondialization. This year, she'll publish two books. The first is a critical study of a selection of canonical artworks from the black art movement titled uh, British Black Artworks, a Debate on Western Art History, and the second is a monographic book dedicated to the collaborative practices of Sonia Boyce titled Sonia Boyce Improv. So I'll, I'll hand over to Ella. Hi, good morning. Um, so as, um, as Anjali mentioned, this is uh, a paper written by Sophie Orlando. One of the criticisms of Rashida Veen's 1989 exhibition, The Other Story, is amazingly close to that addressing Jean-Luc Godard's 1963 film, La Maprise, i.e. a meta-exposure or even a full array of the painful contradictions of the modern world stuck between a weighty past and an uncertain future. The film captivated many, but Irene's exhibition created an equally huge interest and, above all, a real debate that art, crit art critics and theorists are still discussing today. In 2009, Jean Fisher called the other story paradoxical, trying to be included and approved by a system deemed to be unjust and corrupt. The title of the exhibition holds the notion of an alternative account, a story of otherness, whilst highlighting the specificity of the Asian African artists in post-war Great Britain, without mentioning modernism or modernity. So could it be that the exhibition is the story of a misunderstanding? This paper questions the reviews of the other story, focusing on the forms of contemptuous criticism, starting with reference to the works of art, then to the artists. I will use two methods. First, a general approach of the 50 negative reviews to assess the key nature and content of those articles. Secondly, I will undertake a more detailed study, taking as a reference Charles Gaines's work in the exhibition he curated, The Theatre of Refusal, Black Art and Mainstream Criticism. In its catalogue published in 1993, Gaines compared works and reviews in order to identify the strategies of marginalisation that they have suffered. To begin, I will address the contempt of the artworks through the aura and the criteria of art. How does art criticism write the other story? We see immediately how the amount of reference to modern art is tied up with a lack of deep analysis of the artworks presented in the exhibition. In my study of the 50 English articles, which were over 150 words in length and made up the bulk of the exhibition reviews, I found that 50% of the reviews were positive, 22% were negative, and 27 were neither positive nor negative. Reviews that were neither positive nor negative were, however, swayed by the controversy generated by the exhibition. Today, one easily remembers the controversy, but equally the harshness of certain comments towards Irene's curatorial analysis and the artworks. We can still hear Brian Sewell's words. Why have Afro-Asian artists failed to achieve critical notice and establish a London market for their work? To that, the answer is short. They are not good enough. They borrow all and contribute nothing. According to Dario Gamboni, the contempt for contemporary art is such that it encourages negative reactions and a language of refusal, demonstrated by what he calls defamation or disqualification methods. 
These are the use of the suffix dis or de, as in disapprove, delegitimize, destroy, discredit, disqualify, or ab, as in abase, abhor, abolish, abuse. Indeed, one can find that the violence of certain critics aimed at symbolic destruction follows a long tradition in art criticism. As Ruskin exclaimed, showing the power of criticism, too bad for Raphael, I will take him down and replace him with Perugino. The objective, therefore, remains always the same, to delegitimize an artwork and to make it disappear, notably from all cultural institutions, the art history and the art market. What are the elements of this negative criticism? On which of its factors are the arguments based? Negative criticism either avoids controversy or provokes it. It typically cites specific works from artists in the other story without duly studying them in depth. It favours explanations based on social backgrounds and the artists' trivialities, as in Vasari's Lives of the Artists, or even Gombrich's famous The Story of Art. Adding to this old art history approach are other tricks developed to create a negative aura. I borrow this expression from Walter Benjamin, who saw the aura as a negative trait, a loss, a lack, the reversal of fortune and disappearance of status. Adding disappearance of some criteria of art eligibility, such as authenticity, uniqueness and sacredness. Within the reviews of the right, within the rev Within the reviews, the writing is built on at least one, often several, references to artists belonging to a hegemonic Western contemporary view of modern art, like Pablo Picasso, Marcel Duchamp, or Wilfredo Lam. Indeed, 64% of negative criticism quotes recognise works of modern art theorists. Peter Fuller disqualifies Sousa's work next to other Western artists. <coughs> Take the case of Sousa. How good an artist was he? Besides, say, Auerbach or Kozov, he is minor. We find here the reproach, not good enough. In other words, undeserving of any official exposure and a condemnation by comparison with artists recognised and revered by the art world. This discredit by comparison is aggravated by the isolation of one or two salvaged artists, elected from a multitude declared bad or depreciated in the name of a quality defined by the ultimate authority of British culture. This is the case for Marina Vesey. <coughs> I'm grateful to see such a good spread of the sculpture of Ronald Moody and the paintings and watercolours of Ivan Peris, but the overall level is substantially lower than most Hayward annuals, which this exhibition markedly reassembles. Once more, we find a rhetorical construction aiming to maintain one pattern against another and creating an unequal situation between the two. So, a number of reviews can be read as an attempt to reaffirm traits inherent to modern art and to redefine its standards by the constant disqualification of the works not reaching the supposed standards of the time. In other words, several reviewers rewrite the legitimacy of the aesthetic norms and the criteria used to describe modernism. The critical issue is to judge whether a work reaches a pre-existing ideal of modernity. Another very clear sign of a misunderstanding of the exhibition lies in the notable absence of any debate on modernism within all the criticisms. Yet the main criteria for the selection of exhibited works was, according to curator Rashid Areen, to do with having some connection and relevance to modernism. They must have contributed or are contributing to the development of contemporary art in Britain, formally, conceptually and ideologically. And this contribution must be related to the fact of their not being European. They must have helped to expand the boundaries of modernism beyond its Eurocentric framework. Only 29% of the reviewers have attempted a study of modernism, despite it being the subject at the core of Irene's curatorial project. Can we talk of denial, incomprehension, misunderstanding, or are there a disagreement regarding the definition of modernism? The disparity between the curatorial project and its response in reviews reminds us of a more recent case, the selection of works in the Pompidou Centre, Plural Modernities, in 2013. Catherine Grenier, the head of the Art and Globalisation Department at the time, was curating an exhibition in 2013 that had two objectives. 
on one hand to highlight international works of modern art kept in storage until then, and on the other hand to highlight the missing pieces of the national collection, showcasing an alternative or a plural history of modern art. The selection analysed the mechanisms and the nature of the accepted definition of modernity and its missing parts. In this way, she hoped to encourage a debate about the definition of modernity and redefine the criteria set from 1905 to 1970. Guinea hoped that this thorough approach would increase the acquisition of works and donations, and this became the Pompidou Centre's ambitious plan over the following years. Harry Bellet reviewed it positively whilst quoting the publication How to Distinguish a Masterpiece from a Dub by Pauline Pont and Christophe Melin and added that Guinea's eclectic choice proved infinitely more interesting than a series of masterpieces. The sacking of Catherine Guinea and her replacement by the curator Bernard Blistin, who had little inclination for questioning accepted views, ended up with a blunt decision, an open wound at the heart of the exhibition. Indeed, in the weeks following his appointment, the new director brutally replaced works in the main hall of the exhibition, which amongst other th which, amongst others, held the four races by Amédée Ozenfant and a series of art publications of the same time, with pieces considered more important and more representative of the, of the collection, such as Matisse, Picasso and other usual suspects. Breaking away from Guinea's initiative, the Hall of Masterpieces resulted in totally destroying her proposed effort for a new approach. This symbolic and physical action of destruction aim to re-establish the rules as much as to crush any ideas of redefining modern art. Black art and its exclusion from all main British museums for two decades could well have suffered the same fate. Now I will discuss the contempt for the artist as subject through the trope of primitive. The symbolic violence is not only effective, but also particularly intense when you know that 55% of the negative criticism was focusing its venom at an artist and not his artworks. With a closer look at certain negative extracts of the criticism of the works, one can observe a typology of contempt of the artist as subject. The methods of discredit used to aim to claim some inequality in a body of work between its centre and its periphery in order to place the artists and their works in a different historical context or to make groundless accusations against the artists and call them manipulators. For example, Jeff Sawtell, unfortunately, apart from Medalla's pretty bubble machines, nothing of any significance stays in the memory. If it was not for his irrepressible penchant for self-publicity, we would never have heard of him. In other words, for this critic, self-promotion is the only reason explaining the presence of these artists in the exhibition. David Medalla is an exception who escapes this scorn thanks to his pretty work, a, wor a word reducing the review to a bias of taste. Other reviewers accuse these artists of being excessive, too angry, too political, too controversial, and so even too British. All these terms aim to discredit the works as well as mock the artists themselves. Here is how William Packer expressed his feelings towards Eddie Chambers and Keith Piper. As it is, the show falls comfortably into two unequal parts, the work of the older and the younger generations, which coincide more or less with the serious and the silly. That silliness is in the event a kind of blessing, for without its grace, the more hysterical of the political polemics would be downright offensive. With such invectives as Eddie Chambers's Union Jack Swastika, little more than a poster against the hateful National Front, or Keith Piper's sequence of texts, The Black Assassin Today, one cannot but wonder which is the more simply-minded. The selectors pious hope that such examples advance his case, or the authors that what they offer is art rather than the crudest, self-limiting propaganda, visual shouting. John Russell Taylor alluded to exoticism, even otherness, in his article, Right Stuff, Wrong Label, about Anwar Jalal Shemza. There is a perceptible strangeness, otherness, if you like, about most of the work assembled. If I take Peter Fuller's argument here, it hints that Sousa's work is both erotic and bold, referring to the sexual connotations specific to slavery or to the colonial views on natives. 
So the relentless assaults of devaluation and expressions of disdain clearly demonstrate the traits of what is usually defined as archaic mentality, and in particular, the trope of the primitive. Colin Rose offers several definitions of this word in modern art. It is what is missing in complexity, less advanced than the personal thing to which it is being compared. This term is also defined against progressive Occidental society. Prehistoric primitives are often linked to contemporary wild primitives, alluding to its origin or childhood. This return to the use of the term and references of the primitive that was specific to Occidental art criticism since the beginning of the avant-garde might be tied up to the large interest and use of the term around the exhibition Primitivism, a MoMA exhibition curated by William Rubin in 1984. Irene was very interested by it, as shown by his comments at a Slade Art School conference organised by Susan Hiller. The primitive can now be put on a pedestal of history, modernism, and admired for what is missing in Western culture, as long as the primitive does not attempt to become an active subject to define or change the course of modern history. For Irene, this internationally renowned exhibition at the MoMA demonstrated an imperialist attitude towards certain artistic productions, pretending to be the guarantor and protector of all art forms, whilst renewing an exclusive dictature over modern, art, over modern history of art for Occidental artists. In the same paper, Irene deplored the category ethnic art, used to address black art in Great Britain and its separatism, a catalyst to a return to primitivism as championing its originality and exoticism. In fact, the general argument made by the exhibition Primitivism went much further than Irene's comments. Not only its spirit reached the UK, but it seems to have infiltrated the reception of the Afro and Asian in Britain's exhibition, returning Irene's aims against himself. The art critics were no longer looking at the way artists expressed primitivism and modernism, but were categorising the artists themselves as other oriental exotic. This is partly how we end up with a critical debate based 84% on racism and politics and less than 30% on modernism. It therefore includes a few exceptions, especially in the positive reviews. Jane Bryce wishes to pay great attention to and titled by Gavin Yanges providing a positive example of reversal of the argument. Bryce uses the specific vocabulary attributed to criticism of the modernist borrowing or appropriation here to compare the work of Yanges to the one of Picasso, Ernst and Clay with an iconographic Warburgian point of view going back to antiquity examples. Re reviews of this type were, were rare indeed in 1989 and it questions the methods and tools of the criticism applied then. So do we agree with Maurice Berger, who also contributed to the catalogue, The Theatre of Refusal, that there was a blind art critic at that time? A white critic speaking for and from his dominant culture, free to reproduce the same stereotypes and racist clichés. No doubt British art criticism in the 80s would benefit from a historiography in order to clarify how the critics were trained and who decided on their aesthetic biases, as according to Professor Jane Bryce, they seem never have to have been exposed to the idea of black art, since many of them were upper-class white English people who had been educated to see art, with a capital A, a particular way and with particular characteristics. The art critic's inability or resistance to include the artist as subject in an Occidental model resulted in a dead end, preventing what had been so wished for, the value of what those artists would bring to modernism. As the location of utterance of artists from the other story didn't coincide either with what was preconceived or with the new paradigm of globalisation, the reviewers finally had to look at their own situation of utterance as critic and as subject, and they found themselves lost. This turning point finally happened immediately after 1989, and many felt that it was mainly caused by the senior anthropologist's universalist exhibition, Magicians of the Earth. We can now finally start to read the artworks within modernism, something that was not possible until now, due to the culture of contempt. <laughs> <laughs>